In some societies, it is believed that a person is not truly dead until they're forgotten. I'm not willing to go out on that limb, but I do believe that those that have gone on before us should be remembered. And what better way to do that than to honor their final resting place? Over the past two years, I have built and placed a number of grave markers on graves that were not properly marked or not marked at all. I'm standing in one of two cemeteries where these markers have been placed. This is the Old Garber Cemetery, located seven miles north of Benson, North Carolina in the USA. No one's been buried here in over 100 years. This video is about the construction of those markers. I use a computer-aided drawing package to edit the information that goes onto the plates for the headstones. The CAD program which I use is called Cut2D. I'm going to open that up and we'll take a look at it. Next, I'll open a plate for one of the headstones. Each headstone have two files. One file is for the upper plate and a second file for the lower plate, if it's got a lower plate. The upper plate holds more traditional information and the lower plate is kind of more detailed stuff. Note the scaling along the top and on the left side. This allows you to match the plate on the screen with the plate in the router. When the position, size, and layout of the text is the way you want it, then a G-code file must be generated. G-code is the language used to control the movement of cutting equipment, and in this case, the cutting equipment is a router. Once the G-code is generated, the movement of the cutting bit can be seen on the screen. Note the arrows on the text showing the movements of the bit. Next, we need to save the G-code file. The G-code file is saved and we're done. To engrave the grave marker's plates, I use a CNC 640Z engraver. The control box for this engraver is shown. The engraver is connected to a PC which is running Mark III control software. The G-code that was generated from the previous program is loaded into the Mark III program and the Mark III controls the engraving process. The plates are made of vinyl. They may be purchased from any building supply center and come in a variety of lengths and widths. I normally purchase the vinyl board in 1 inch by 6 inch and a length of 8 feet and then cut them to whatever length I need. The engraving process is repeated twice to remove the small fibers left from the first pass. This is what it looks like when complete. With the routing complete, next I'll use black silicon and apply it to the surface of the plate. Use black silicon. I'm using an applicator to force the silicon into the letters. The plate has a slick side, which is the back side of the board, and a textured side, which is the front side of the board. This plate is routed on the texture side and is more difficult to clean than the slick side. I found using acetone or paint thinner will assist in the cleaning process. Unfortunately, I have neither at the present. And even though I know it's risky business, I'm using gasoline. The task is complete for the present. After the silicon cures, I'll finish the cleaning process. The cross is going to be constructed of aluminum. And what you're seeing now is the uh, smelters that I have. see the aluminum in there, it's in a molten state. It's got some impurities on top, but I'll dip them off, off camera.
anytime you're dealing with metal in a liquid state, it's uh, it's very dangerous. So I'm trying to be extremely cautious here. Across this port. That's gorgeous. It's time to mill the cross get it smooth it was a little too thick stop it mm -mm. this is the back side of the cross it isn't as important as the other side the other side. The other side isn't polished, but it's good enough. So that's the back. That'll be the front. Next, I've got to have some way of holding the cross in the concrete. It's too smooth. If you were to just pour the concrete around it, it would it would fall out over time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill four holes in it and put self-tapping screws in there with the screws uh, remaining out about a half an inch. And that should work to hold it in place. Speed it up. Keep this one taking so long. Now the holes are drilled, I'll put the screws in. I'll give you the profile of it here at the end. I have two sizes of concrete forms that I use the larger and the smaller and this is the larger and I use the larger normally if I'm using two information plates and the information plates go face down on a sheet of Lexan the Lexan keeps the concrete very smooth on the bottom one problem I had early on was these plates would shift when I poured concrete in and what I do is put these spacers in there now and that prevents that from happening and of course there's two plates in this next we'll go to the reed bar after this now we we'll kind of skip over some of that because I kept hitting the camera with the reed bar and uh, I don't need that embarrassment so I'll, we'll kind of go through that part of it okay here comes the reed bar Okay, the next spacer that goes in there will keep the reed bar at the correct distance from each other, the correct spacing more or less. And also as you pour the concrete in, you can slide that part down and uh, it, it just works much better that way. Now I'll put in the screws. The screws will hold the reed bar to the information plates and uh, It'll also hold the uh, plates in which the concrete is poured because if you didn't have screws or something in the back of them, they could possibly vibrate out over the years. I'm going to speed this up a little bit so we don't spend so much time on this one thing. Gosh, I moved well for an old man. All right, we about got all of those in. Get a closer look at it there. Next thing I'll do is I'll take the cross. I know that you, you, you'll put the cross down 
after the concrete's poured, but you don't want it to hit anything, any obstacles that would prevent it from going flush with the concrete. So that was what that was all about. It looks good. Mixing the concrete. I'm using an 80 pound bag. It's 5,000 PSI. I've used 2,500 and uh, the headstones broke. I tried it on two. It just, uh, it, it, it don't work. And the 80 pound bags are kind of <laughs> difficult to wrestle with, but that's okay. It works out that 80 pound is the exact amount that you need for one headstone, one large headstone. I have the sound muted because the mixer is so loud. Some water in there quick to get the dust down. I'm not going to spend much time on the uh, concrete mixing process. This is kind of like watching submarine races. It's, it's just not very exciting. I don't like the color of concrete by itself. It's just kind of a, a light gray. So I put one bottle of dye in it, one bottle per uh, 80 pound bag. And I use black. You end up with a uh, kind of a charcoal finish on your concrete. And it's not on the surface like I'm, of course, it's all the way through it. Kind of have to pour it in slow and easy. take it about five minutes of turning around in there and it'll uh, it'll even itself out it's time to pour the concrete and poured it may be the wrong word what I actually do is uh is kind of get it out by the handfuls this first part is kind of delicate because you don't want to shift those plates around I move the spacers back just a small amount. Notice the viscosity of the concrete. It's it's really wet. It's a lot wetter than what they would recommend. But it it works. It's much easier to work when it's this wet. Video is running very fast. I think 4x or something like that. Yeah, there you go. Also, notice the color of the concrete. The dye really does work quite well. Okay, we cut that short. What I'm going to do next is vibrate the concrete a small amount with a hammer to get the uh, bubbles out of it. You'll see some bubbles come up as I'm doing it. A big one about halfway down. It would really be good if I had a vibrating table. not smooth this out very well because a couple of things have to happen one is the stamp that I'm going to put in it that's going to mess the finish up on the lower end that stamp will go below the uh, ground level and it'll have my name on it get a closer look at it toward the end when I take it back out
can do the cross next. This is the first head marker that I've made with a, with a cross in it like this. I'm kind of anxious to see how well it turns out. Speed it back up. I'm not super good at finishing concrete, so it won't be really super slick on the back. Three days have passed since the marker was poured and the concrete has hardened enough to be removed from the form. I'll speed things up a bit. The marker weighs about 90 pounds. Five thousand psi concrete is quite strong, and the edges of the marker can cut you. It's best to file the edges off. This one's ready to install. During the video, I did not indicate that there were two markers being built at the same time. This is the second. It is for an infant that much of the information needed is not available. The main problem is the death certificate was either lost or never produced. That was common in this time period. In the cemetery that this marker goes in, it is the sixth in a row of infants that do not have death certificates. On the early markers, I used to cut off the excess reed bar flush with the bottom, but I found that it helps to stabilize the marker once it was installed, so I leave a small portion. Looks good. We're in the second cemetery where I have placed grave markers. This is the I.V. Eason Family Cemetery located about one mile north of Benson. The newest grave here is 1929. When researching cemeteries, you meet some very interesting people, as is the case with this young lady to my right. When I was clearing underbrush and first discovered her marker, the question came to me, what caused this girl to die at the age of 14, so young? And the strangest thing happened while researching how she died, I discovered how she lived and in doing so enriched my own life. So I would like to dedicate this video to Nellie Eason. Thank you for watching.